Hi everyone, this is Miss Moore and today we are learning how energy is transferred within the biosphere. If you don't have a copy of the lesson notes in front of you today, please feel free to make your own notes using lined paper or by typing them out in a Word document. Today we're warming up with two questions. Firstly, how do plants and trees obtain the energy needed to survive? And how do other living things like humans obtain the energy we need to survive? Please pause the video here while you think about these questions. Plants are capable of performing photosynthesis to convert solar energy into usable energy for their biochemical functions. Animals can't do that, so they have to consume plants as herbivores do, or they have to consume other animals as carnivores do, um, or both in the case of humans and other omnivores. No matter what you eat, the energy ultimately came from the sun. The sun is the direct source of energy for all the organisms that live on our planet. Green plants and single-celled plant-like organisms use the sun's energy to make their own food using a process called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, there is a chemical reaction that takes place that transforms light energy into chemical energy. And when plants do this, they are storing the energy in glucose, which is an organic molecule, a type of sugar, which is energy dense. All living organisms need to eat glucose. They need the chemical energy stored in glucose to survive. No matter what you eat, your body can ultimately break it down into glucose pretty efficiently. Whether you're eating simple carbohydrates like a cupcake or complex carbohydrates like whole grain bread or vegetables. Humans and most other living things consume plants to obtain glucose, which they then break down using a process called cellular respiration. In cellular respiration, the glucose is converted into a form that your body is able to use for biochemical processes called ATP. Next, we're gonna watch two short videos which walk us through the chemistry of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. To watch these videos, just visit YouTube and search by name or click on the links in the lesson handout. As you're watching, please answer the following questions. How are autotrophs different from heterotrophs? And provide an example of each. What is the chemical equation for photosynthesis? Where in the cell does cellular respiration occur? And what is the chemical equation for cellular respiration? As we saw in the video, autotrophs are organisms that create their own food to obtain energy, such as plants, whereas heterotrophs have to consume other organisms to obtain their energy, like us. Photosynthesis is a chemical reaction that takes carbon dioxide and combines it with water and light energy to produce glucose and oxygen gas as a byproduct. Cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria, an organelle in the cell which is responsible for several important functions. The chemical equation for cellular respiration is like the reverse of that for photosynthesis. It takes the glucose and combines it with oxygen gas to break it down into carbon dioxide and water and the most important part, usable energy or ATP. Here are some examples for you to think about and try on your own. How are photosynthesis and cellular respiration related? After a plant uses photosynthesis to create glucose, how does that plant then extract the energy from the glucose to survive? And example three, this diagram shows the molecular structure of ATP. The straight lines in the diagram represent covalent bonds, which we know are the sharing of electrons. How do you think your body gets energy from this molecule? Please pause the video here while you try these examples. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration are complementary processes. The whole point of photosynthesis is to make glucose, and the whole point of cellular respiration is to turn that glucose into a type of energy the organism can use to survive, ATP. 
So after a plant uses photosynthesis to create glucose, the only way to extract that energy and convert it into a usable form is for the plant to perform cellular respiration, just like the rest of us heterotrophs, to obtain ATP. Energy is stored in chemical bonds. We know this from our chemistry unit, and we didn't talk about it a lot because the focus of Science 10 is the breaking and reforming of chemical bonds during chemical reactions. But basically, when these bonds are broken, all of the energy stored inside the bond is released, and it can be used for biochemical processes. In fact, the energy is released in specific subsets when the bond between the rest of the molecule and the terminal phosphate here is broken. This section of the molecule breaks off and the energy is released, which is used for all the biochemical processes in your body. On the third page of your notes, I included a summary table that basically compares and contrasts photosynthesis and cellular respiration, just in case you need kind of a mind map guiding you through the similarities and differences between these two processes. Okay, on to producers, consumers, and decomposers. This is basically how we categorize every living thing on Earth according to its function. So producers make their own food. Examples of producers are pretty much every single autotroph ever, green plants, and some single-celled organisms, anything that can carry out photosynthesis. Consumers are organisms that have to eat producers or other consumers to obtain their energy. Examples include humans, most animals, and pretty much all living things other than producers. The final category, and the smallest one, but arguably very important, is the family of decomposers. These are organisms that break down dead organic material, like waste. They chow down on dead plants or animal tissues to obtain the energy that they need to survive. Examples include bacteria and fungi, but in doing so, they're also part of a really important regenerative process that completes our food chain. Which brings us to the subject of food chains. Food chains model how the stored energy inside an ecosystem moves from one level to the next how that energy is passed on from organisms at the bottom of the chain to the top. Um, in the example diagram here, you can see a terrestrial mountain ecosystem, terrestrial meaning land base, And you'll notice that there are arrows as part of this food chain, and those arrows indicate the direction of energy flow. They always go from the producer to the consumer. Starting with the grass and other plants, which are the producers in this ecosystem, to the marmot, for example, to the golden eagle. I don't have to tell you that the interactions between organisms in an ecosystem are infinitely more complex than grass to marmot to golden eagle, which is where food webs come in. In reality, these organisms are interconnected in a complex network of relationships, and so a food web is a much more detailed way of representing these connections. For any ecosystem, a more realistic model of feeding relationships shows a network of interacting and overlapping food chains. This is called a food web, and it weaves together at least two food chains to show how an ecosystem functions as a whole. Let's practice analyzing a food web in example four, which gives us a basic mountain ecosystem from the producer to the highest level consumer. And we're supposed to identify how the grasses, seeds, berries, and flowers are different from the other organisms and identify four separate food chains within this web. Please pause the video here while you try this on your own. 
Grasses, seeds, berries, and flowers are all producers. They're special because solar energy enters this ecosystem through these organisms, which are autotrophs, via photosynthesis. In this food web, there are multiple food chains. I've identified two, for example, and I'd like to remind you that no matter where you start, you should be at a producer, and no matter where you end, you should be at a decomposer. You may notice that these food chains aren't very long. They maybe have two organisms or three if they're a short chain, or four or five if they're longer, and that's because energy is lost as one organism consumes the last. Only 10% of the food energy created by a producer is actually available to the consumer that eats that producer, and that's because the producer has already used most of this energy, 90% of it, to stay alive and perform from its own biochemical processes. All of these major functions that keep an organism alive uh, require energy, including things like growth, heat, staying warm, and performing cellular respiration, and of course, processing and disposing of waste. In this diagram, it shows that only 10% of the food energy made by the plant is available to the organism that eats the plant, in this case, the first level consumer. And then only 10% of the food energy stored in the first level consumer is available to the second level consumer, and so on. So each subsequent consumer higher up the food chain can only access 10% of the energy stored in the previous organism. By the time we reach the third level consumer, they're only getting 0.1% of the energy originally stored in the producer. The energy diagram below exemplifies this. Primary producers have access to 100% of the energy they create via photosynthesis. First level consumers get access to 10% of that energy, or 10% of 100%, which can be computed as 0 0.10 times 100%, or 10% in total. Second level consumers have access to 10% of the previous portion of energy, which is 10% of 10%, or 0 0.10 times 10%, which is 1%. And third level consumers have access to 10% of 1%, which is 0.1%. Now it's time to start our mini research project, Plot the Pathway, where you can choose any ecosystem in the world of interest to you and explore and analyze it using the tools that we learned in today's lesson. Please take a look at the project outline now. Bye for now.